Good morning, APU. Good morning, West Campus and East Campus. It's great to see all of you. Um, we have an amazing speaker this morning, and in just a moment, our president, John Wallace, will come to introduce her. And before we do that, I wanted to uh, share a few announcements and updates with us as a community. Um, first and foremost, I want to say welcome to all those who are joining us today as guests uh, at our APU Admissions Open House. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. It's great to have you with us. We hope you enjoy your time here at APU. Um, additionally, we wanted to give a few shout outs because uh, three of our athletics teams are currently competing in the playoffs and so we wanted to celebrate them, okay? Um, first, we, our men's soccer team is moving on to the third round of playoffs, Division II playoffs. We'll be hosting Cal Poly Pomona, hosting Cal Poly Pomona here on Thursday at seven o'clock. So coming out and support the Cougs on Thursday night. Um, also, our women's volleyball team is in playoffs this year. <laughs> Captured the first ever PacWest Conference Championship in our program history, and so they'll be playing in Washington on Thursday as well. And, and our men's football team as well are going to be going to the playoffs after winning the, the GNAC, a great Northwest Athletic Conference Championship this week. And so they're going to Texas on Saturday to play, so way to go. If I could have the, any, anyone here from the men's soccer team, women's volleyball team, and men's football team play Please stand just for a moment so that we could recognize you and congratulate you on a wonderful effort. Congratulations on West Campus and those who are on East Campus. We're proud of you. Keep up the good work. So proud of you. Um, today also is, um, is a special day because this is the day that we observe um, Veterans Day. And yesterday was official a Veterans Day, and so uh, we want to recognize those who are veterans. We have veterans that are students at APU. Uh, we have students who have parents and family members who are veterans, and so we want to recognize um, and appreciate those who have served our country and allow us to have the wonderful freedoms and rights that we uh, sometimes take for granted. So we appreciate you. Um, if you are a veteran or if you have a family member who is a veteran, would you please stand at this moment as well so that we could recognize you and appreciate you and your family's contribution to our great country. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, and of course, lastly, being in Los Angeles, California, um, during this time, uh, we have many of our, uh, our fellow uh, Californians who are uh, struggling right now with fires that are taking place in Northern California, as well as not too far away in Ventura County and the other side of LA County. And so we want to make sure that we remember that uh, and offer a word of prayer. Uh, so would you join me in a word of prayer uh, as we pray uh, for veterans, um, for the families they represent, and for those who are uh, working their way through uh, the devastation through these fires that have taken lives, um, properties, and a number of other things. Uh, Lord, we come before you today thanking you that you are God, thanking you that you are sovereign and that you are in control. Um, but we also recognize that there are those um, in our midst right now who have family members who are, uh, have to have evacuated or maybe even homes that have been destroyed by the fires that have taken place. Uh, Lord, we ask for comfort for those, for hope, um, for protection for those who are fighting these fires and agencies that are coming uh, to support and aid. Um, Lord, we, we pray for those who are displaced that you would uh, provide for their every need for uh, food and clothing and shelter. Uh, watch over them, Father. Uh, our hearts go out to them. And even for our students right now who are dealing with this directly, Lord, we pray for comfort for them as they're here and, and families are elsewhere going through these different things. Lord, we also lift up our uh, veterans and thank you for their service. Uh, we pray, Lord, that they would be uh, surrounded by resources to allow them to continue thriving. Um, would you protect them? And we appreciate all that they have done uh, for this uh, wonderful country. So, Lord, we cover these uh, things and we ask for your presence to be over all of it. Uh, we ask that you hear our prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, now, please uh, help me welcome our president, John Wallace, as he introduces our speaker. Well, first of all, for, uh, for freshmen and uh, transfer new students, let me just say I didn't get to welcome you at the beginning of the fall semester, so welcome to Zeusa Pacific. Um, I have missed this. I missed you. Uh, and what a great weekend for the Cougs. Um, nice job for the women's volleyball, men's soccer, and men's football. Uh, this was my chapel day in the calendar and then chemo started and 
I needed recovery time, so I picked up the phone and uh, called the, the best chapel speaker I know, Kate Wallace Nunley. Uh, she is our daughter. Uh, Gail, who's sitting in the front row, and I have been married 43 years, and, and three kids, and God gave us this child who, uh, who speaks at other Christian colleges and now at APU and has a, a message. Uh, she is married to Leaf, also an APU alum. Both of them are APU alum. They live with their two dogs in Bakersfield, California. Um, and, uh, and Kate is a pastor of a church with her husband Leaf up there. Uh, she and her mother, Gail, my wife, uh, co-founded the Junia, J-U-N-I-A, the Junia Project, which really advocates for women in ministry and promotes a conversation for all of us around fully utilizing our gifts in ministry and service. So would you welcome alum from 2010, Kate Wallace Nunley. Good morning. Wow, it is such a great privilege to be here at APU Chapel. I can't tell you how much I love being here with you all. I grew up on this campus. I was a little kid causing all sorts of ruckus. I broke a few doors and stuff. It was bad. But it is so fun to be here. I am an alum of APU and since graduating answered the call to pastor a church and so I'm also a current student at APU Seminary. And yes, I love APU. <laughs> Leaf and I got married in Darling Library about three years ago. This place is our home. So thank you for the warm welcome. Thank you for having me. I want to hear from you this morning as we get started. So how many of you here, make sure we can hear you, have gone to the APU South Africa semester? Nice, lots of you, okay. Well, as a student, I never got to go to South Africa, but the, the semester was getting started, uh, but my dad got to go a lot because he was starting the semester there and then he was visiting all the students. So after I graduated, he decided that I needed to go and experience South Africa. So he put me on a plane and off to South Africa I went, where I spent three months in Peter Maritzburg, KwaZulu-Natal, in the countryside of South Africa. And as many of you know, South Africa is a really interesting place. And it actually has 11 official languages. 11. To put that into perspective, the United States has zero official languages. <laughs> and they have 11. Luckily for me, one of them is English. But the primary language spoken as a first language in South Africa is Zulu, which is the language of the largest tribe. And the township I was in was a Zulu township. So that was the language that I heard the entire time I was there. And the mother of the township, the woman who looked out for everyone, was named Pindile. And I remember the first day that I got to that township in South Africa, and I got out of the SUV and I saw Pendile walking down the dusty road to greet me. And I stuck out my hand and I said, hi, I'm Kate. And Pendile brushed past my hand, looked me straight in the eyes, grabbed me by the face and said, Salbona, Kate. We're so glad you're here. I wasn't quite used to greetings like that growing up in Southern California. But something strange happened the whole first week I was in South Africa. As I met person after person who lived in that township, I continued to stick out my hand and say, hi, I'm Kate. And time after time, they continued to ignore my hand, look me in the eye and say, Salbona. Can you say that with me? Salbona, beautiful. This greeting was different. I felt more acknowledged somehow although I don't know why. And so one day I asked Pendile to teach me how to say hello in Zulu. And she kind of looked at me like this was a funny question. And she just said, oh, Zulu people don't say hello. I was like, okay, Pendile, then what is this uh, greeting that everyone keeps saying to me? And I will never forget what Pendile said that day. 
She said, Salbona doesn't mean hello. Salbona means I see you. I see you. What an amazing thing to be communicated in a greeting, right? I mean, how many times a day do we say, hey, how are you? And then never stop to hear the answer. <laughs> but Salbona is different. In order to say Salbona, you have to stop what you're doing. You have to look someone in the face. You're saying, I see who you are. I see your humanity. I see your character. Salbona is more than a greeting. It's a reaching out, an extension of dignity. Salbona means, I see you. We all long to be seen, don't we? We want to be acknowledged when we walk into a room or are in a group. Even introverts, I am slightly introverted, I do have to admit, I don't always want to be unnoticed. I do sometimes, but not all the time, right? Sometimes we want people to see us, to notice us in a crowd. It's a human need, I think, a longing that we have to know that we're not alone on our journey. We want someone to reach out and say, hey, I see you. But when we're going through difficult times, times like this past week here in California, we tend to pull away from other people, don't we? It is in those difficult times that we don't want to be seen by other people. And it is actually in those moments where we need to have people see us the most. We need people in those times to come alongside us and say, hey, I know everything is not okay. You're not in it alone. I see you. This past year was kind of a hard one for me. It was a difficult year. And I'm finding about myself that when I'm struggling, when I'm in a painful and hard season, I don't only pull away from people, I tend to pull away from God. And it is in those moments where I'm so distracted by my grief or my pain or whatever it is that I can't even find the words to pray. And in those moments, I have found it really helpful to borrow the prayers of someone else. Luckily, in the Bible, there is actually a book of prayers. The book of the Psalms is a collection of 150 prayers written to God. And there are prayers about everything. There are psalms about praise and worship. There are songs about lament and suffering. There are psalms that portray thanksgiving or wisdom. And all throughout history, the people of God have looked to the psalms and they have sung them out loud or read them out loud. And when they didn't have the words to pray, they prayed the Psalms. And as I was thinking about what God might have for us this morning at APU Chapel, I thought of one Psalm in particular, especially following this hard week for so many of us. I think that Psalm 113 has a good message for us this morning. Hear the word of the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time on and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is high above the heavens and his glory above the nations. Who is like the Lord our God, who is seated on high, who looks far down on the heavens and the earth? He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes, with the princes of his people. He gives the barren woman a home, making her the joyous mother of children. Praise the Lord. Now, it might seem counterintuitive when we're talking about a season of suffering to look to a psalm of praise. But I think there's something really important to be learned from Psalm 113, especially in those times where, you're, where we are needy or in pain or grieving. 
Because Psalm 113 teaches us that even though our God is big, and even though our God is seated on high, our God looks down and sees us. Our God takes the time to know what causes us pain. Our God takes the time to know us in our season of suffering. You are known by God, especially when you are going through hard times. Did you see that? Who is like the Lord our God, seated on high and looks far down? Who raises the needy and the poor and gives the barren children? This is the character of our God. Our God not only sees, but chooses the poor, the needy, the barren, and raises them up for God's purposes. This is the God we serve, that even though God is big and on high, God looks down and says, I see you. I see you. No matter how much you pull away from others, no matter how much you are trying to hide in your season of pain, you are not alone in it. You are not invisible to our God. The Psalms have been especially helpful for me in this season. My husband Leif and I have been trying to get pregnant for a couple of years, and we're realizing that that might not be a possibility for us. And when that reality becomes more than I can bear, I pray Psalm 113. Not only because when I pray Psalm 113, I'm praying the word of the Lord that God fills empty wombs, but also because when I pray these words, I'm praying the words of another woman who struggled to get pregnant. You see, the author of Psalm 113 actually borrowed language from another part of Scripture, an older part of Scripture, from the song of Hannah in 1 Samuel 2. Hannah sings, my heart exalts in the Lord, my strength is exalted in my God. There is no one holy like our God. The barren has borne seven, but she who has many children is forlorn. The Lord raises up the poor from the dust, he lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. Sounds a lot like Psalm 113, doesn't it? You see, borrowing the words of prayers has a long tradition. Even the psalmists do it. And these words, the words of Hannah, the words of Psalm 113, they bring me comfort even as I recognize that I might not be one of those women who gets a miracle baby. But it reminds me of the hope that I have in God. And it reminds me that God sees barren women, that God sees my suffering, that God sees me. And this idea of God seeing me, that's not just a truth that's contained in the Psalms. That's not just a truth that's contained in the words of Hannah. That's a truth all throughout Scripture. Our God is the God who sees us. That is the character of our God, that you are not only seen, but chosen and loved, and God is with you in those moments of suffering. Just think about it. All throughout Scripture, Abraham and Sarah, old and unable to have kids, but God saw them and chose them to birth a nation. David, a lowly shepherd boy, God sees him and chooses him to defeat a mighty warrior and become king of the people. Esther, a child, a parentless child in a foreign country, God sees her and raises her up to become queen and save God's people from genocide. And perhaps the, the story that captures this idea of God seeing us is best said in Genesis 16 which is the story of Hagar. You might remember Hagar. She is the slave girl of Abraham and Sarah. And at this point in her story, she has become pregnant with Ishmael. 
And Sarah, her master, has so mistreated her that Hagar has run away. And she finds herself alone, pregnant, in the desert, and without hope. And God sees Hagar. Now, Hagar isn't the one who's chosen to birth God's people. But God comes to Hagar, a slave girl, a foreigner, without a home, and gives her a promise and restores her. And Hagar is so moved in Genesis 16, so moved that God would see her and would come to her. But do you know what she does? In response to this, Hagar names God. And do you know what she names God? The God who sees me. Hagar is the first person in the chronology of Scripture to name God, the first person. And the name that she gives God is the God who sees me. The story of our God is not the story of a God who is too far off to care about what we struggle with. The story of our God is a story of a God who looks far down and sees the poor, the needy, the barren, and comes to them. The story of our God is a story of a God who loved us so much that God couldn't stay away. And God moved heaven and earth to come and be with us, to be a human to walk among us and to take on our pain so that we didn't have to carry it alone. The story of our God is the story of a God who looks down and says, I see you. I see you. Maybe you're struggling this morning. Maybe your version of being poor and needy and barren is a broken relationship. Maybe you're worried about the health of a loved one. Maybe you're worried about finances. If that's you this morning, I want you to know that God sees you. God sees you. No matter how much you try to hide, you can't hide that part from God. And God loves you, and God goes before you. And it is my hope that in the times that you find yourself struggling and you're so distracted by your pain and your grief that you can't find the words to pray, I hope you pick up the Psalms and I hope you borrow the words of those who've gone before you. It is my hope that you learn through the Psalms about this side of God, the God who raises the poor and lifts the needy, the God who gives the barren children. It is my hope and sincere prayer, APU, that you get to know our God, whose greeting sounds a lot more like that of the Zulu people than our own, who is seated on high, but looks far down and says, I see you. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you. We thank you that this morning you have already gone before us. We thank you that this morning, although you are seated on high, you see us. That you know everything that we are going through, that you know what we are struggling with. God, we thank you that it is your character, that you just can't help but see us in our need. I pray that you go before every student here, every person here, and that you show them that they are deeply loved and deeply known by you. Show them, God, your character, and go before them as you see them this, this morning. And it is in your Son, Jesus' name, that we pray all these things. Amen. Shalom. Go in peace.